In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Saint Jerome, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Uh, speaking of Saint Jerome, I, I didn't mention this uh, in the homily, but, um, you know, it's good for the sake of truth and arguments to give... Uh, <coughs> Yeah, what St. Thomas Aquinas would do on any given issue is that before he would destroy the, the, uh, the position of somebody else who had, a, who had a wrong claim, maybe who claimed that Our Lady was not a virgin or something like that, before he would um, dismantle their argument, he would strengthen it as much as it could possibly be strengthened. All right, so imagine that getting in an argument with somebody, but before you engage... You take their argument and you see, all right, in what ways can I strengthen their argument? And let's see, does it still hold water with the, the strongest possible case for their position? All right, so that was the method of St. Thomas Aquinas uh, because he was a servant of the truth. If, the, if whatever we claim doesn't hold water, why claim it? And so at any rate, um, on the issue of the Bible, and what books belong in the Bible. We've talked about this before. Basically, everybody had 73 books in the, in the Bible uh, from the beginning. And uh, it was basically a non-issue until Martin Luther came around and threw out seven books of the Old Testament. Now, let me bolster the Protestant claim for a second. They will point to St. Jerome, and they will say, St. Jerome didn't think that those seven books belonged in the Bible. That's their strongest possible argument, okay? That St. Jerome had questions about uh, whether or not we follow the Jews in not accepting those seven books or not. All right, so we propped up. That's the strongest, I think, possible argument they could make. But this is our counter to it. Jerome submitted to the church. Jerome said, all right, if the church believes that these books are divinely inspired, I will submit to that. You know, Jerome's a very intelligent man, and so is Luther. But with intelligence, sometimes comes pride. And sometimes you don't want to submit. And sometimes you're so glued to your own opinions that even if somebody had true authority on the matter, uh, you may want to rebel against it. Okay. So at any rate, uh, Jerome, while he had some questions about it, ultimately he went along with the church because he knew that the church has the, the voice and the authority of Christ. Okay, and that's how we know what belongs in the Bible. All right, so last time we ended by talking about certain things in the church, um, like the altar, the ambo. Anybody remember what ambo means in Latin? Close. Uh, two. Uh, I heard two. Both. 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 So both the epistle and the gospel will be read. All right. Um, what I want to do here is just give you um, bird's eye view on uh, church architecture. Uh, this isn't absolute. It's not every church, but this is a, this would be a classic Western church. Okay. And so this is how it would be designed. Uh, first of all, what you see, what's the basic shape? A cross, okay? Because the, the church herself joins Christ on the cross, okay? Um, in the liturgical action. Remember, that's the whole Christ celebrating the divine mysteries, the sacraments. And so you see, uh, we are all invited to join Christ on, on the cross in that self-oblation. So just, just, just the layout of it. Um, now, we have a curve here. That's because in the ancient, uh, well, in, in Rome, ancient Rome, a Roman basilica would have this basic shape. Okay? And so that's where a lot of uh, just uh, commercial activity would take place. A lot of things would happen. And then in here, that's where a judge would hear cases. And so you would have a, you'd have a court uh, in front of a judge 
who would sit in what's called an APS, uh, A-P-S-E, APS. And so uh, this sh basic shape took on the meaning of, of judgment, going before the judge. Now, what did we talk about? When was it? Um, well, the last two days at, at the Latin Mass, we were looking at those prayers before Holy Communion, and one of them was talking about judgment and condemnation. Why? Because every time we receive Holy Communion, what does St. Paul tell us in 1 Corinthians? Every time we receive the Lord in, in Holy Communion, there's a judgment on us. That sounds kind of weird and kind of harsh, doesn't it? Well, read the, when you read the Gospels, whenever our Lord encounters somebody, uh, what happens? If that person has a sin, that sin bubbles up to the surface. You know, so the Samaritan woman has had five husbands. And that comes up to the surface pretty quickly. Is that because the Lord just likes to beat up on people? Like, oh, you're a bum. No. What does he want? He wants to reconcile her. So the first, first step in that is bringing to light those sins. And so when people would encounter Jesus in the Gospels, uh, sin has nowhere to, to hide. <laughs> it's in the presence of the light itself, truth itself. And so when we receive Holy Communion, this is why if we have a mortal sin, this is why we need to go to confession before communion. Because uh, St. Paul says to the Corinthians, some of you are sick and some of you have even died because when you have received the body and blood of the Lord, you have done so unworthily, not discerning the body and blood of the Lord. And so the church always understood that as having an unconfessed big sin on your soul. So this basic shape had this uh, idea of judgment attached to it. And so oftentimes in churches, you would have an apse. Now, what's, what's functional about an apse as well uh, would be the, the sound. You could, yeah, the acoustics can uh, send out sound, right? Okay. So there's a, there's a function to it, but there's also a symbol to it, all right? Um, that's, that's very frequent with liturgical things. Originally, there was a, a need, a functional need, but then it, it took on a symbol. And so a church then, and if this is the communion rail um, right here, if that's where we encounter Jesus and receiving Holy Communion, we're doing so, there's that sense of judgment. Okay? But also it has the benefit of, when the priest is uh, uh, praying or chanting, the reverberation with, it, you know, of course we don't have microphones back then. It uh, helps for people to hear. Okay? So, um, that's the basic shape. This is called, uh, so the main part of the church is, is the nave, as in uh, like the belly of a ship, okay? This is the nave, kind of roughly where the, where the tummy is, isn't it? Um, this part itself, where the altar is, is the sanctuary. Now down south, our, our Protestant brothers and sisters, they call the entire church what? The sanctuary. Okay, so it's a slightly different uh, vocabulary. Whereas when we say sanctuary, we mean the, uh, just that particular place where the altar is. Now the communion rail uh, was there, yes, to have a dividing line between the sanctuary and the nave. Why? Because the church is mean and wants to pe keep people away from Jesus. I guess that's, no, that's not it at all. Rather, the uh, sanctuary represents heaven. The sanctuary represents heaven. And where we receive Holy Communion is right on the cusp of heaven, right between heaven and earth. That's where we receive Jesus. Okay? Now, in Western churches, a lot of times they are very long. And one of the reasons was that is to give a sense of a journey. Right now we're in the middle of Mark's gospel and they're in their final trip to Jerusalem. And even in the gospel, they're calling it the way. Okay. And so the way to Jerusalem, the way to the cross, the way to one's end, one's death, uh, one's judgment. And so that took on the, for the early Christians, a symbol of the Christian life. You're heading to not an earthly Jerusalem, but to the heavenly Jerusalem. You're in a pilgrimage 
Pilgrimage is a huge, huge theme in the Western church. And so you get a sense of traveling, ba-boom, ba-boom, towards heaven. And when you receive Holy Communion, it's, in a way, it's like a practice. Going before the judge. And, um, and if we're in a state of grace, to receive his blessings and his love. Okay? Um, trying to think what else. Well, usually uh, baptismal fonts were either in the back here, or maybe there was a little side room here, or in the narthex. Okay, the point is, it's close to the front door because baptism is the door to the church. Okay? Now, you also have uh, a narthex, which has a function as well. It's a period of, it's a place and period of transition from the outside world to the church, from the mundane, uh, the secular, to the sacred, okay? And so um, there's a sense of uh, transition, so you'll get some fun colors and stuff like that, which is, uh, depending on what color scheme you have in the church, which have a little bit more celestial theme, you have something a bit more earthy and uh, transitioning. At any rate, um, so a narthex, uh, would uh, would be there. Uh, any any questions on uh, just basic church architecture or basic features while we're on this topic, Tony? You're drawing to the to the left there. Did you say that was a basilica that was used for secular um, trials and court hearings? Yeah. Or so, was it a, or was it a courthouse? Yeah. So basilica was a secular term before the church took it to herself. Basileus in Greek is a king, so it's like a palace. Uh, so it has more of a secular type deal. But uh, I'm sorry, what was your question so, again? So it, was that secular. a secular building? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what happened in the 4th century was once uh, Christianity is legalized, uh, and Constantine was very favorable towards Christians, uh, now they're able to function, out, uh, function publicly and openly. And so... Um, they started asking, well, what type, of a, what type of a building is appropriate for what we do? So the fourth century is, is a very, very important uh, time. Very important century. Um, now, in the Eastern churches, the Eastern Orthodox, um, they don't focus so much on, say, pilgrimage, but rather they focus on already being in heaven. And so we're going to, we'll, we'll look at a clip from... The Eastern, um, this would be the Russian Orthodox Church. And, well, you're not going to get a sense so much of the architecture. But like the Hagia Sophia, for instance, in Constantinople, modern-day Istanbul, um, it's more like there's a dome in the center. And so it feels like you're already caught up into something, namely into heaven. Okay? Because that's what you're doing. You're joining the angels and the saints in heaven who are worshiping endlessly. Okay, and so both are valid. It just depends on how you approach the sacred mysteries. And um, I really, I wish we had a projector or whatever, but uh, we'll we'll do our best here, and I will. So it's the Patriarch of Moscow. Can you guys see it at all? Okay. So that's their Eucharist. You'll notice it's leaven bread. You'll notice what direction they're facing. Those are deacons. So we can keep going and all, but the um, point is a couple things. One thing you'll notice that there are images all over the walls, um, images of the saints, meaning they're surrounded by the saints, meaning there are, it's already a foretaste of heaven. Bless you. What you'll notice there in that liturgy, and we're going to talk a little bit about liturgical diversity, is uh, that liturgy is from the time of St. Jerome. That liturgy is from the late 300s. That's the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom 
who was the uh, patriarch of Constantinople at the end of the fourth century. And again, it's not that he decided, hey, let's create a new liturgy out of nothing, but rather, again, codifying that which was handed on to them. All right. And so the, the Eastern Orthodox, they didn't have a huge reform where they threw out their whole liturgical tradition. Rather, they retain uh, their liturgy, which is largely from the fourth century, which is pretty wild when you think about it. Um, Quick question. Yes, absolutely. Before we go to liturgy, let's stay on architecture. So is the architecture of a church, the variety in the architectures of the churches, more a function of tradition and what an architect is trying to uh, convey in terms of feeling as opposed to directives from like church law? Yes. So, I mean, uh, in terms of church law or um, documents from the church, you know, the church will encourage um, honoring tradition and uh, having it reflect the reality there in sort of in vaguer terms. The church isn't going to dictate, hey, you have to have an X percentage of Gothic churches, X percentage of Romanesque uh, churches, etc. Like some of the modern ones now are like semicircles yeah. and stuff that just... Yeah. Architectural expression. Yeah. So, again, you know, the, a good point to bring up. And what we're not talking about here is necessarily preference, but what is the purpose of all of this, of sacred art and architecture? This isn't the only type of uh, architecture in, uh, in the West. Um, there are, uh, like I said, uh, Gothic. And this, is, this is not, I mean, Gothic kind of shares that same basic cruciform shape. But you'll remember, we talked briefly about how Gothic has the Gothic arch, which has a very strong emphasis of verticality, okay? Um, but the point of architecture is to reflect that which is taking place therein, all right? So I think, um, you know, in, in recent decades, there's been a temptation to have function, uh, Function and modern art sort of uh, push everything, um, as opposed to uh, building something that reflects heaven. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, I mean, you get some, there's some modern, look, there are ugly churches out there, okay, all right? I come from one that looks like a spaceship, okay, and I've seen some better looking spaceships, um, but for instance, you know, some, it's almost like stadium seating and like the sanctuary, you have to kind of go down like kind of like a movie theater. The, why would you do that? Why would you put the sanctuary in the lowest point if it's just function for people to be able to see um, what you're losing there is a sense of the importance of that place um, or churches in the round? Why would you have a church in the round? Think about it. Why would you have pews on every side of the altar such that people get distracted looking at the guy across from the, the church picking his nose? Huh? Why would you do that? Well, if you're focusing on, um, if you're going to focus on the assembly, then that would be an architectural reflection of focusing on the assembly. And I'm not going to give you know, any particular you know, person a hard time or anything like that. I mean, sometimes architects just are doing their best or whatever. But my point is, is that architecture does have an impact. It moves the soul in the same way that a good story can move the soul. Uh, unlike say like a theor theological argument. Um, so it, it, uh, these things are very important. And uh, I think beauty can, can greatly assist us because prayer is difficult. To keep our attention is difficult. So if you have a beautiful building where everything works together, it keeps your, fo your attention focused on the altar, for instance, that is a good thing. Okay? All right. Uh, anything else on that stuff before we move on? Okay. All right. Uh, I want to share with you a little bit about vestments because it's nowhere in our book, but people usually have questions about these things. Uh, so, um, I'll just show you, okay? Um, traditionally, even the way that the vestments are laid out, 
everything traditionally, essentially was designed for fat old Italians, okay? <laughs> Seriously. Like, uh, you know, solemn high mass, you're getting genuflect. Well, the guy next to you holds your elbow to, you know, give you a little bit of support. And so it, you could be a 25-year-old priest or an 85-year-old priest, and it's dignified. It doesn't matter how old you are. There's a sense of dignity, um, whatever. So even the way that vestments are laid out, uh, there is function to it, but it's to assist, especially an older priest, to be able to, to vest. Um, because even this should be part of the ritual. Now, a lot, and this has been lost uh, very much so. I mean, a lot of times priests just kind of throw on vestments. They're talking and joking and all that stuff. And again, I'm not giving any particular person a hard time. But um, my point is traditionally, uh, priests were encouraged that even your act of vesting should be a prayer. You need to be preparing. You're doing something incredible, okay? So um, you need to prepare yourself and do it well. So even washing, first thing uh, priests do, they wash their hands. There's a certain prayer, uh, begging our Lord, help me to serve you without any sort of uh, pollution of mind or body or heart uh, to, with a pure mind to be able to serve you. So it's very functional, just getting garbage off our hands. The very first vestment is what's called an amos. Honestly, I don't know what the etymology for amos is. It's essentially a sweat rag, okay? So there's a little cross on here. I kiss the cross. And then for a moment, I put it on my head like that. And because the prayer that goes along with it is all about putting on the helmet of salvation. You know, in medieval times, you would have a metallic helmet but you would wear a cloth underneath the helmet because to have, you know, metal on your head isn't going to be comfortable. So at any rate, um, there's a sense of putting on the armor of God and of the helmet. Okay. And then it um, just ties around like this and you just tuck it in because you know what? It gets sweaty up there, even with air conditioning. Okay, so these things are essentially sweat rags. Uh, the next vestment is what's called an alb. Albus uh, um is uh, white in Latin, meaning it's a white cloth. Um, and so it's the reflection of your baptismal uh, graces, the baptismal garment. Okay, and so um, in the prayers all about, you know, vesting us in the white garment for we've been washed in the blood of the lamb. Um, with the, the graces of salvation, okay? Um, graces of bap baptism. All right, and so uh, I got this one from the, the nuns that make the altar linens for St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Uh, they do very, very good work. So it's high quality linen, etc. Again, not to be just particular for a particular sake, but rather you're, you're trying to give the Lord your best and not cheap stuff. Okay. You have more than one of those. Uh, yes, and um, and so the point is, it goes down to the to the ankles. But you'll notice on higher feasts, uh, my elves have more uh, lace and more. You know, they're just fancier. They're nicer for a higher feast. There's what's called um, a gradation of solemnity, or um, what's the phrase? where it's like not every day is Easter Sunday, <laughs> okay? <laughs> High feast, you pull, out, you pull out the really nice things, okay? But your Tuesday in ordinary time, maybe not so much, okay? The next thing is essentially a rope, okay? But it's called a cincture. It has a high function of just kind of keeping things together, a large a voluminous garment. And um, it, the prayer is all about uh, purity, uh, begging <laughs> our Lord for, uh, just for purity, okay? And then this next vestment, um, you don't see a lot. I get a lot of questions about. It's called the maniple. So I kiss, uh, there's a cross here, which I kiss. I place on my left arm, uh, maniple from manus, meaning hand, like manual labor. Um, essentially, originally it was the sweat rag, Okay, and the prayer that accompanies this vestment is laboring for the Lord. All right, work hard. And as uh, 
Adam worked for the sweat of his brow, from the sweat of his brow, he, you know, he labored. Uh, so there's a, this, this um, emphasis on laboring hard for the Lord. In 1967, this became optional. So basically everybody th um, just threw it out, but it, bless you, remains optional. Therefore, I opt to use it. Um, How does it work optional? If it's one of the steps that you take, how can you just, it's like St. Christopher. Uh, so yeah, so how did this become optional? Well, it goes through the whole liturgical reform thing. Uh, because you would not have seen this in, say, 4th century Rome. This would have been a later vestment. And so the fad in the 60s was, we need to go back to the early church. And so if you didn't see this in the early church, uh, so the uh, document Trace Anos of 1967, they just said, they said that the maniple is no longer required. They just, you know, uh, you know how I feel about these things. <laughs> but uh, the next uh, vestment is the soul. Notice how little I have to move, by the way. Everything is right here. So I can be doing this at 85 years old um, with as much dignity, or who hopefully more at that time. <laughs> Father, who sets your vestments for you now? Uh, Peggy or Donna? Uh, Miss Donna does. Okay. Uh, does a great job laying out my vestments. Um, so the, uh, the stole represents uh, authority, priestly authority, uh, or Episcopal authority, because uh, uh, bishops wear it, or diaconal authority. So... You'll notice deacons wear the stole across this way, okay? Um, traditionally, priests would wear the stole crossed like this, um, unless it was hanging freely uh, for things outside of mass, um, because my powers are bound, okay? If a priest is consecrated a bishop, his powers are unbounded. He has the fullness of the priesthood, and thus, the bishop uh, wears his stole like this, all right? Now, after the reforms, um, they, uh, it's not strictly required, but they clearly wanted priests to go from this, uh, uh, from this way of wearing the stole to this way, um, which was funny because at Vatican II, actually one of the theological points that Vatican II developed was the episcopacy and just how the episcopacy is different from uh, the, the priesthood, the regular priesthood. And so you would have expected liturgically a uh, greater variation from what priests would do, from what bishops would do. But this is an instant where now uh, priests and bishops look the same. So at any rate, um, young priests uh, will definitely cross their stoles. Um, and, uh, and that's that. So there's a way of put, keeping all this together. And then the, the last vestment is what's called the chasuble. So this is proper for a priest and a bishop. Because remember, a bishop offers mass as well. He offers a sacrifice as well. But a deacon would not wear one of these. Okay. And so it uh, represents uh, charity. Okay. And so um, it's all about putting on the yoke of Christ and uh, reflecting on his charity. Uh, occasionally, you'll see some priests wear their stoles on the outside, which is rather strange because it's not how they're supposed to be worn. And symbolically, what they're showing, maybe they don't mean it, is that their authority is more important than their charity. No, it should be the charity covers everything. Um, the charity of Christ. Okay. Any questions on, on these? Oh, and the last thing, this isn't a vestment technically. This is what's called a Beretta, okay? Spelled differently than your gun. Um, <laughs> it's essentially an academic hat, okay? It's not a vestment. Um, uh, when you go to graduation, your graduates wear squared shaped hats, okay? So uh, I haven't done a deep dive on the history of these things but uh, they share the same history as your academic gown, graduation gown, hat. Okay, and uh, they're also academic Berettas. If I got a degree in canon law, for instance, and I'd have like green piping, um, or if I became a Monsignor, uh, it would turn into a magenta 
uh, purple or whatever. So, but this is just a standard uh, Beretta. All right, any questions on vestments before? I do. Go ahead, fire away. When you come into the church for mass, you're wearing one thing, and then on the, ah. the altar, you're changing. Yes, yes, very good question. So I start Mass on Sundays. Uh, well, no, I don't start Mass. That's the thing. It looks like we start Mass with me wearing one vestment. It looks like a cape, but it's actually called a cope. Okay? So cope, C-O-P-E. And um, originally it was, a, uh, it was a rain jacket because you would go outside for processions and stuff like that. But uh, essentially the cope is used for liturgical ceremonies outside of mass and so that the sprinkling rite that we do is technically right before mass and so that's why i'm wearing a different vestment again that looks like a cape because it's technically right before mass and then as soon as i'm done sprinkling folks i i change it out and put on a, a chasuble because mass is beginning okay All right, and then for the, yes. And the manifold you take off when you do a homily. Uh, yes, good, very good question about the, um, well, the manifold, you'll notice I don't wear during the sprinkling rite because the, man, the manifold also is uh, more proper just for mass, okay? And so outside of mass, you just wouldn't wear it. Um, I honestly don't know why. Um, I just know that's the case. Uh, but taking the manifold off, uh, it's not so much for the gospel reading, because you'll notice on Sundays, I take off the maniple, I place it on the book, on the missal, and then I go and I read the gospel. Well, the only reason I'm taking it off then is for practical reasons. Traditionally, uh, I would be reading the gospel from the altar, then I would take the maniple off, and then go preach. So the real issue is taking the maniple off in order to preach. Why? Because my, the words of my homily do not hold the same weight as the words of the Mass. And so that's one small gesture of communicating to folks, okay, Mass is paused, and I'm going to preach. Now, the French used to remove, or at least some of the French would remove their chasuble and place it on the altar, then they would go preach. Again, to show that Mass is paused and um, these are the words of the priest. Now, I should do my very best to reflect to you the teachings of the church. That's my responsibility, and the Lord will judge me on that. But that's just liturgically a um, the reflection of that. Martha? Um, I'm trying to recall. Did we ever read the Mass when we were still using the Latin way back. Did we ever, I don't remember having that sprinkle, sprinkling ritual. Did, we, did, did they ever do that back then? I don't recall it. It would have been done at the principal mass on Sunday. Okay. So the high mass on Sunday. And even that was optional. They didn't have to do it. So uh, most of the times you would see it, but sometimes you wouldn't. Okay. All right. Let me uh, share with you then a little bit about the, uh, just the, the chalice and stuff like that. Um, all right, so ooh, this is basically a chalice, all right? This is my personal chalice. Um, I don't know if you noticed in that video with the Russians, uh, this style, which would be French Baroque, is inspired by Eastern Orthodox. So there's a whole history with chalices. Um, but this is a mid-19th century uh, French um, so at any rate, so that, that, that's the chalice, okay? It's not a cup, it's a chalice. And then this is what's called a purificator, okay? And so it's folded a certain way, but it sits on top of the chalice, okay? And so this is reserved, not like for sweat, uh, but for purifying the chalice. So, I mean, all these things end up getting blessed, by the way, all these things, and, or the chalice is consecrated with uh, holy chrism, with oil. All right, but that's a, so it has a very practical purpose of being able to, to wipe out the chalice because I'm responsible for every droplet and every crumb of the most blessed sacrament. 
And so ritually, everything was highly prescribed. And as long as you follow the prescriptions, you're going to be pretty safe that you're going to be collecting all of the, the Blessed Sacrament. Okay? That's why I'm so meticulous, so. Um, you'll be amazed. Sometimes when I break the host, boom, you'll see a, a, a piece of the Blessed Sacrament fly. All right. This, what looks like a dish, is called a patent. All right? Something is patently obvious. It, it is laid open. So this is open. And the host, the main host, sits in this little well. Okay? And this is placed on top of the purificator. Uh, this is called a pall, P-A-L-L. -L, all right, uh, it happens to have Pope Benedict's coat of arms on it, um, but it can be whatever design you want. And it goes on top of uh, the patent, and that's gonna have a good function, one, to protect the host, um, but also in order to be able to cover everything with a chalice veil. All right, so this is a chalice veil. And the reason why the veil, the uh, chalice is veiled is because it's consecrated, all right? It's, uh, it's a holy object. It's the object in which wine becomes blood. And so it's therefore veiled. There's a whole theology of veiling. Why do we veil things? Um, and so that Paul helps keep, uh, helps the chalice veil fall nicely on top of the, the chalice. This cloth is called a corporal, and it gets, it gets laid out. It's basically the cloth on which I have everything, all right? So you can collect any fragments that go astray or that get dropped. If precious blood gets spilt, uh, hopefully it gets absorbed in this cloth. Um, it's called a corporal, corp coming from corpus body, because the host used to sit directly on this cloth. Um, therefore, uh, it was given the name corporal. And even the way that it's folded, I don't know if you can really see it, even the way that it's folded, it will capture every fragment so that no fragment uh, escapes. The corporal is kept in what's called a burst, not a purse. Purses are for women. This is a burst with a B. And so um, that's kept in there. And that's what's going on at the chalice. Any questions? <coughs> when did the burst become optional? Everything basically became, strictly speaking, what's optional. You can see a priest just wear an alb and a stole and have a chalice and, and, a, uh, and a patent. And I, you can get by, in terms of strictly speaking, with the, with the new rituals, you can get by with very, very, very little. Mm -hmm. All right, so who washes <laughs> who washes this? Um, my, the, 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 my magic angels uh, uh, do it. Uh, no, uh, Donna is very helpful in keeping things uh, orderly um, back there. Okay, uh, anything else on this? Okay. Uh, how are we doing? Man, that took a while, didn't it? Good grief. I hope that was I hope that was helpful though. You've seen this stuff for years. I you know. Uh, I meant to ask, um, do you have your own vestments? Are they all yours? Okay, yes. Yeah. So um yeah. colors Sure. Are the yeah, we can talk about colors. So uh do I have my own vestments and the different colors? Um I do have my own vestments. Uh but I've also in the last uh two years, a year and a half, whatever it has uh, been, commissioned new vestments uh, for uh, St. Jude and as well as up at uh, OLM. So uh, I have a, a, a seamstress lady who does, uh, who does wonders. And um, so at any rate, you know, every parish uh, should have its own vestments, but also every priest normally has his own vestments and they go with him uh, wherever he goes. Uh, so my vestments will go with me, my chalice will go with me. Uh, but you also make sure that every place has its own stuff. Uh, the different colors. Uh, white uh, is used a lot. It's for, uh, well, obviously Easter, Christmas, but even today we use white for Jerome. Jerome was not a martyr, but he's a saint, okay? 
So he's a, he's a confessor. Uh, he was a doctor of the church, uh, a great teacher. And so at any rate, uh, white in a way is kind of default. Uh, red for martyrs, uh, so the blood of martyrs, uh, the fire of the Holy Spirit for Pentecost. Um, now, then they started throwing red into Holy Week. I honestly don't know why. It doesn't make any sense. Like on Palm Sunday, what? It makes no sense. But anyway, um, green uh, would be, um, well, ordinary time. Uh, the Latin is per annum, so through the year, time through the year. And uh, so traditionally, it wasn't called ordinary time or time through the year, but time after Pentecost. And so you had a connection with Pentecost. So even if we're at the end of September right now, uh, there's a connection back to Pentecost because that is the event where the church is born. The church, in a way, begins her journey, like sailing, you know, uh, through history, uh, throughout time. Uh, And so there's a connection to Pentecost. And so, um, but green being a uh, a symbol of growth, of, of life. The Holy Spirit gives life. Um, And then the Eastern churches, green is more associated with the Holy Spirit. But uh, as far as I can tell, green is a reflection of the life that the Holy Spirit gives. Um, I could be wrong on that. And then violet is a a color of uh, penance. So hence uh, uh, Advent and Lent. I honestly don't know when it took on that symbol because violet used to be the imperial color, right? Because uh, violet was the hardest uh, dye to obtain. I think you had to get it from, uh, was it clams or something? It was the hardest color to make in the ancient world. So therefore, only the emperor or the empress would wear violet. But obviously, at some point, that changed. And so it took on a symbol of um, penance. Gold can replace any color except for violet or black. Uh, and so gold uh, is certainly an option and uh, might have a greater connotation of glory, heavenly glory, of victory, things of that nature. And then black, of course, is the color of mourning. And so requiem masses uh, were traditionally in black. Uh, in the, the, the modern form, you have the option of black, white, or violet. Um, I don't know why violet or is it penance when you know somebody dies? That doesn't make sense to me. Um, but uh, at any rate, but those are those are the colors. I don't think I'm missing any. Oh, pink, Mary. oh uh, well, it's not pink. Okay. <laughs> Ladies wear pink. No, it's rose. Uh, Rosaceus uh, um is the um, so rose only worn twice a year, just at, past the midway point of Advent and of Lent. So Gaudete Sunday, Laetare Sunday, those are the first words of the entrance antiphon, both Sundays. And uh, it represents light shining through the violet, light shining through the penance of Advent and Lent. It's a, it's a symbol of hope that we're past the halfway mark of Advent, we're past the halfway mark of Lent. And so... Third Sunday of Lent, I mean Advent? Uh, Third Sunday of Advent, fourth Sunday of Lent. Okay. And feast days for Mary, they usually wear blue. Oh, okay, yeah. So um, only regions that were part of the Spanish Empire were given permission to wear blue, like flat out blue. So I wore wore it a few times when I was in Mexico. Um, But... uh, but blue ordinarily is not a liturgical color, although you can have Marian vestments that are, are white, but may have a strong secondary blue. Okay, so that's probably what you've seen. Yeah. Father, your casket, what's the history on that? My, the, uh, the cassock of the priest. and yeah. So it's um, servant's garb, okay? It's not a dress. <laughs> so... Uh, it's a, it was a traditional servant's garb, okay? Um, black for se- uh, death to self. It's also very thinning, so that's a... Yeah. Okay. Uh, 33 buttons for the years of our blessed Lord. Um, collar, obviously, for obedience. Christ was obedient unto death, 
and so his priests better be obedient. Um, and then usually I have a cincture on, but I, I was coming in here with vestments, so my black cincture, the same thing as um, that cincture, uh, purity. Um, but it's also a sacramental, meaning that it is blessed, and it is a, it is a, um, a source of grace for me. So in the morning, I will kiss the top of my cassock, and I pray the Dominus Pars Hereditatis, which is the Lord is my portion, and my inheritance. It is he who will repay me my inheritance. In other words, um, it's a, this is the sign of a cleric. Okay? And so a uh, cleric comes from the Greek word kleros, meaning a portion of land. And that's coming from the tribe of the Levites. Remember when the 12 uh, uh, tribes of Israel uh, going into the Holy Land, the one tribe not to receive a portion of land when they're dividing up the land is the tribe of the Levites because that was the priestly tribe. And so their inheritance was not a portion of land, but rather the Lord himself. So a priest who is not married, doesn't have that portion of land, as it were, doesn't have that inheritance, is not tied down to this earth in that sense. But the Lord himself is the inheritance. And so uh, just like with uh, holy water in the back of a church, which is re uh, reminiscent of our baptism, we can dip our fingers in there, make the sign of the cross. And as long as you do it with piety, and you dispose yourself, that's a source of grace. Stirring up those baptismal graces that you received, of being a son or daughter of God, uh, um, and uh, at any rate, it can be a source of actual grace. The same as uh, something like the cassock. It's a sacramental, therefore it's a source of grace. Now, I could just wear the pants and the clerical shirt, but those, that, those aren't sacramentals. They're not blessed. They're functional. And there's a place for them. And, like international travel... Sleeping on a plane in one of these, I've done it. It's not the funnest, but uh, at any rate. But I wear the cassock uh, because it's a sacramental. It's a source of grace. And it's a reflection of not just what I do, but who I am. Okay? Okay, man. These are all fantastic questions today. I'm glad to... Has, is it the cassock that has the five buttons? <laughs> Yeah, for the five wounds of Christ. Um, I don't really know the history. I, I, I'm pretty sure it was Napoleon who put buttons on the sleeves of his shoulder uh, of his soldiers so that they wouldn't do one of those wiping their nose <laughs> when, when they had their tail between their legs leaving Russia. Uh, so, okay. Well, let's try to get through a couple of these, uh, and then yeah, we're not going to go long today. So we're on page 73. Uh, we ended with 246. Let's go into 247. So this next section is a very short section. There's only three questions. Liturgical diversity and the unity of the mystery. All right. Uh, why is the one mystery of Christ celebrated by the church according to various liturgical traditions? The answer is that the unfathomable richness of the mystery of Christ cannot be exhausted by any single liturgical tradition. From the very beginning, therefore, this richness found expression among various peoples and cultures in, uh, in ways that are characterized by a wonderful diversity and complementarity. All right, so remember, Christ told the 12 apostles, do this in remembrance of me. So all of them received the same formation, but then they went out. And they established churches. Those are apostolic churches. And in a couple of those cities, uh, those became very influential liturgically. How do you celebrate Mass? How do you celebrate the sacraments? So Rome was obviously a major source, a, a major location for liturgical influence. Antioch, Syria... Another major city for this. Alexandria in Egypt, 
another major city. Then eventually, of course, Constantinople, because that becomes the new imperial capital. Uh, and so that ends up having a dominant uh, history. But my point is, is that just between Rome, Antioch, and Alexandria, uh, these are apostolic churches. And so they look very similar, those liturgical traditions, but they look different. Because they've been growing in different uh, fields for 2,000 years. So you saw a little glimpse of the Russians, the Russian Orthodox, which is the exact same as the Eastern Catholics. It's the exact same liturgical tradition. Uh, so that looks really exotic, sounds exotic. But there are a lot of similarities. All right? And so uh, they, they have the same basic structure of the Mass as we do. Um, but, again, with the liturgical reforms uh, in, in the 60s and thereafter, remember, we were trying to look more like the Protestants. So one of the effects of that was that our modern Mass looks less and less like the Eastern Orthodox. You'll find a lot more connections between the Eastern Orthodox liturgy and the traditional Latin Mass, just the way that it's structured, etc. Because, again, both have that, you know, uh, very, very ancient tradition. Um, Okay, uh, 248, what is the criterion uh, that assures unity amidst the plurality? Uh, it is fidelity to apostolic tradition, that is, the communion of the faith and in the sacraments received from the apostles, communion that is both signified and guaranteed by apostolic succession. All right, remember, so just that, that lineage of validly ordained bishops, one after the other, linking us all the way back to the apostles. All right, so therefore, it's perfectly fine. You know, we can have this variety, but there's also unity in that. There's nothing, nothing inimical between the, the Eastern liturgies and the Western liturgy, okay? 249, is everything immutable or unchangeable in the liturgy? In the liturgy, particularly in that of the sacraments, there are, there are unchangeable elements because they are of divine institution, the church is the faithful guardian of them. Uh, there are also, however, elements subject to change, which the church has the power and on occasion also has the duty to adapt to the cultures of diverse peoples. All right, I, well, yeah. Uh, all right, basic principle there. Um, some things can never change, period. You have to have wheat bread. We talked about this before. You have to have grape wine. You have to have water for baptism. You have to use the words, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The church does not not have the power to change those words because Christ himself gave us those words at the end of Mark's gospel. All right. Uh, the same as the words of institution of the Blessed Sacrament. Um, although I'll put an asterisk next to that. Um, so there's certain things that simply cannot change. Other things can change. For instance, uh, inserting the Nicene Creed at Mass. Nicene Creed wasn't always there. In fact, the Apostles' Creed is newer than the Mass itself because the Mass started in 33. The Apostles' Creed is sometime between 33 and 100 AD. We don't, it's, it's a first century. We don't know where it is, um, where it began, um, except with the Apostles'. Uh, so like all those names, uh, that I say in the Eucharistic prayer, um, those are names of martyrs from the, uh, second, third and early fourth century. So obviously those names weren't there before they lived or died. Um, so some, the point is, is that some things will grow organically and I'm not going to, I, I beat this dead horse plenty enough in terms of um, the liturgy should grow as a living object. It, it's not a, uh, a piece of machinery that a, a technician can come and just change. You know, oh, well, we're gonna throw out that model, we're gonna give you the newest iPhone, the newest liturgy or something like that. But, all right, but the point is some things uh, can change, but I would argue, and the church always understood it as slowly, organically, through time, um, and then, uh, other things can't change. All right. That's, uh, 
I think that's good for today. Any last second questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, well, those with, uh, yeah. Go ahead. I have researched a little bit of that, mm -hmm. and there's always some little trace of wheat in it. It's mm -hmm. not completely wheat-free. Yeah, it's low gluten, not uh, gluten-free, the, the host that we use. And I've never heard of somebody having a problem uh, with that. But yeah, so the gluten, but that's, that's an interesting question. And this is a, a newer phenomenon, obviously, but I think that's something that I don't, honestly don't know who, you know, how do you come to that understanding in terms of how much gluten needs to be in there? Um, sometimes you'll see, and I'll end with this, like with the wine, you'll see me pour in wine, then I pour in just a droplet of water. But if I accidentally pour in too much water, you'll see me go back to the wine. Uh, and I'm doing that because I don't want it to be overly diluted and therefore invalid. You know, because if it's too much water in there, it's going to be invalid. So I, well, I just bring that up because these are interesting questions because uh, liturgists and rubricists, you know, talk about these things. Uh, you know, because he, these questions do come up. And at any rate, some, qu some questions we have answers to pretty, pretty easily. water into the wine, you take the purifier and go around the edge of the, why do you do that? So why do I take the purificator and wipe the inside of the chalice after I do a little bit of the water? Every droplet. All right. So when I pour a little bit of water in there, there's usually a few droplets on the side of the uh, chalice. And uh, I'm just, uh, usually those are water. And so I just, I wipe those. Because that water needs to be in the wine. Um, yeah, now every the smallest thing is the point isn't to be meticulous for the sake of being OCD. The the point is care in the little things. Showing care by taking care of those those little things. So the purificator and the corporal do they have to be laundered in a specific manner? Yes, yes. So they need to be soaked. Anything that comes into contact with the Blessed Sacrament is soaked for 24 hours. Why? To give the Blessed Sacrament the, uh, the chance to dissolve. Okay? And then furthermore, um, in a sacristy, what there ought to be is what's called a sacrarium, which looks like a sink, but it goes directly into the ground. So that you're not putting sacred contents into the sewage line. We have something that looks like a sacrarium here, but it's tapped into the sewage line, and so I have a strict uh, uh, forbidden, forbidding not to use it until we get a new line tapped uh, into the ground. So. And so what you do is you take the water that's got, and you dump it on the plants. So we got to go outside. You gotta, it's got to go into the soil or on some whatever blessed plant. So. Sewer <laughs> line. <laughs> All right. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. Through the intercession of Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, Saint Jerome, and all the angels and saints, may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. See y'all. Thank you.